Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I am Scott Swenson. I'm the Vice President of Communications for Common Cause. And I would uh, like to welcome everyone to this afternoon's session, back to the plenary. Um, we have a, a special uh, presentation and conversation here that I want to give uh, thanks to uh, a friend of mine, Ben Weisner from the ACLU, uh, for helping to arrange, to my colleagues uh, Todd O'Boyle and Jesse Littlewood for their efforts in making this happen, uh, and to our guests who I am now going to introduce. It is my honor to introduce Dan Frumkin. He is one of the finest thinkers, writers, and journalists documenting uh, the fascinating times in which we live. Dan proves that it is possible to be in Washington without being of Washington. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, as an editor of The Intercept, uh, he has a great front page uh, story today, which uh, we think we're going to pop up here not mine, in yeah. just a moment. Uh, his paper has a great front page story that links to today's conference. Uh, it's the uh, FBI versus Apple fight just got less white. <laughs> So a nice way of mixing the technology uh, and democracy issues that we're about to talk about uh, and some of the race and democracy issues that we have been talking about. Uh, so check that out at theintercept.com. Um, Dan is an outspoken proponent of accountability journalism. He wrote the popular White House Watch column at the Washington Post from 2004 to 2009. His career in journalism started in local news, and since then he has served as the senior Washington correspondent for and bureau chief for the Huffington Post, an editor of the WashingtonPost.com, and as deputy editor of NeimanWatchdog.org, Dan Frumkin will introduce our other two panelists. It's my honor to introduce Dan. Thank you very much for being <laughs> it's not a talk with Ed yeah. Snowden if you don't have technical difficulties first. So. There, we go. there we go. All right. Okay. Hi, thank you all for being here. Um, I think this is a particularly exciting moment to be having this uh, combination of speakers because I think what's happening right now is that racial justice issues are finally and appropriately colliding with surveillance issues as part of what hopefully will be a national debate on these topics. We couldn't have two better guests. Uh, Malkia Cyril is the founder and executive editor of the Center for Media Justice and the co-founder of the Media Action Grassroots Network, which is 175 organizations working to ensure media access, rights, and representation for marginalized communities. Thank you. Thank you. Um, they spearheaded the net neutrality fight and now just recently joined the uh, fight over encryption with the FBI. Um, our other guest doesn't need a whole lot of introduction. Let me just say, ladies and gentlemen, the man who brought you post Snowden America. <laughs> <laughs> It's not a pretty place, is it? Um, so I want to talk, uh, start off with a little bit with Mal talking to Malkia about uh, sort of the history and impact of surveillance on communities of color. I think uh, it's been a lot less hypothetical than it has been for a lot of the sort of elite white, older gentlemen like me who, who have been <laughs> talking about this. So Malkia, tell, tell me a little bit about sort of what, what the experience has been and, and what your concerns are in the, in the moment. Well, first of all, I'm really honored to be here and in this conversation with uh, my brother Ed Snowden. Thank you for having me here. Um, and, and I think the, the best contribution I can make to this conversation in, in this particular question is really to tell you more about, um, you know, to, to reaffirm two things. One is that, you know, the, the revelations of bulk data collection and, and, you know, spying on our phones, it, that feels new to some, but for someone like me, and for many people like me, it feels very, very old. In, in 1974, I was born into what some may consider the painful aftermath of COINTELPRO, the counterintelligence program's uh, destruction of the Black Panther Party. My mom was a Black Panther. She edited the Panther newspaper. She coordinated the New York City citywide Black Panther Breakfast Program. I spent my entire childhood in fear of the police. 
Um, and not just in fear of the police in terms of uh, you know direct interaction with them, but in fear of who may be listening on our on our calls, um, in fear of, of media coverage that um, it told a false story about about uh, about this movement that was growing that that had grown in this country and had been destroyed in part by by uh, surveillance. So you know I think the most important thing to, to acknowledge is one that hit surveillance has a very, very long history in this country. Um, and you know, for three decades, the United States has built a domestic surveillance apparatus on the basis of perceived criminality. And media has been, you know, pretty complicit in stoking those fears. And out of that, you know, that trifecta of a war on drugs, crime, and terror, we have this ideological and physical war on black bodies and really all bodies of, uh, of color, poor bodies, gender non-performing bodies that's been enacted by law enforcement, legitimized in the press and in the court of public opinion. And that puts my life at risk, right? So that what I consider an asymmetrical war with people who look like me, um, treating people like me as enemy combatants has eroded my civil rights, my human rights, um, has eroded the, the right to vote in the form of felony disenfranchisement, the right to housing, education, employment without discrimination. But, but the thing I think that's most important here is this, that that mass surveillance that we fear so much, including like the bulk surveillance we say is so unfair because it targets those perceived as perpetually innocent, is built on the surveillance, um, policing and adjudication and incarceration of those who are considered perpetually guilty. And I think we're talking about, and I think that's what we're talking about fundamentally. We're talking about um, centuries now of building a system that perceives black people and other people of color as perpetually guilty, right? So understanding that, that history of surveillance in communities of color, we have to first acknowledge you know, that the history of power relationships in the United States, those with least, uh, the, uh, less power are always watched for the purposes of control and control might be called by other less accurate names like safety or national security, but what it is, is actually control. So since slavery, right, when the use of a past system separated um, the people associated with a particular territory from the quote unquote non-people, right, who are meant to be excluded, managed, or seen as threats, national security surveillance has always been mediated by, by race and anti-blackness has been the fulcrum of national security surveillance since its beginning. Thank you, that's amazing. Thank you very much. Um, Ed, I really haven't heard you talk a lot about uh, some of these issues. Are they ones that are on your mind much? They are. I mean, there's, Mel can't cover an extraordinary amount of ground there. One of the interesting things that I would mention is when we think about surveillance, the government likes to call it a uh, sort of bulk collection. That's their euphemism for mass surveillance, that's enhanced interrogations for torture. Um, but when we talk about uh, this kind of indiscriminate collection, why is it such an issue, right? Uh, and when Malkia says things like it, it degrades sort of your, your civil rights, your human rights, what does that actually mean? Well, what it means is the quality, not just of the life for an individual, but the quality of society that we all enjoy collectively. And this is something that is just beginning to come to the fore in a very powerful way. Because largely, the revelations of 2013 were not about surveillance. They were about democracy, right? How did we get to this point that we had, for more than 10 years, the indiscriminate collection uh, of the communication records of every man, woman, and child, both inside the United States and without, without ever having a public vote, without ever having uh, the public's uh, even embarrassed knowledge of the outside lines of these programs. Uh, the Patriot Act uh, was what uh, allegedly authorized the section of the, uh, the NSA's activities, but the author of the Patriot Act, uh, Sensenbrenner, said there's no way that the uh, particular clause that they were referring to, Section 215 of the Patriot Act in this uh, case, could be interpreted actually in that. And when we look back at the congressional record and the historical record, there are strong grounds for, for believing that. Uh, when it was being debated, it was being called the library records provision because the absolute worst abuse that we could conceive of 
uh, for this sort of legislative passage in this long, gigantic bill that nobody actually read before they voted on, uh, was that it might be used to compel libraries uh, to hand over the borrowing records of their patrons, which is chilling enough on its own, right? But then to think that that's what we actually considered to be the downside of the public debate, but the actual use of it was, no, no, no. These aren't particularized individuals and particularized investigations at particular libraries that we want particular records about. They consider for the purposes of investigation everyone's communication records to be relevant. Ed? Now, Ed, what does this Ed. mean and where does it go? Yeah. No, I'm just wondering what you think specifically of, of the, the notion of communities of color being more subject to this than, than other folks. Right, so we have this indiscriminate network that, that's sort of arisen from the problem space. Uh, but the usage of these powers is not at all indiscriminate. In fact, it's very discriminate. I mean, this is, I mean, we see this in every sort of institution of power, application of power, uh, that, that sort of the state uh, presumes for itself. Uh, we see this as a partial state, things like that. And even its impact, so not only are uh, people who are, uh, have less access to resources and education more likely to go to prison, uh, and not only are minorities more regulated, but they actually feel simply the social impact of policing in a very different way. Now, Matthew was talking about her past. She grew up uh, not trusting the police, right, feeling that they were a threat. Whereas me, for myself, I came up in an entirely different environment uh, you know, when I was in middle school, elementary school, uh, we had like the D.A.R.E. program, the anti-drug program, and I knew the police sergeant from my local community because he'd come by and give us all these scary talks, and then he'd give me a ride home in the squad car at the end of the day, and I thought that was just the coolest thing ever. Uh, so we need to be, to be clear about why is this the case? And I think this is largely uh, because who is the system really architected to represent, right? We, we talk about democracy, but are all voices of democracy truly represented in the same way? Uh, particularly in the political process in the United States, where money has such an extraordinary influence, uh, people who have less access to wealth, uh, and particularly disenfranchised minorities, may not even have the same access to the political process or education uh, resources in general are necessarily going to be less represented uh, than industry, than, than big money, uh, and then even just the traditional sort of centers and focuses of power within society. And what this means is when the laws are being drafted, uh, they don't get a say, but and also the operation of these laws. When you work at CIA, when I worked at NSA, they were trying to become a more diverse institution, which is something we should be thankful for. Uh, but when you look back at, you know, when the FBI considered Martin Luther King to be the largest national security threat in the nation, a determination was made, by the way, two days after the I had a speech. Uh, you know, there, there's a correlation here. He becomes a leader that can have political influence, political change, and now suddenly he's the greatest uh, national security threat. How do we get to the point where that's okay? How do we get to the point where in the meeting, you know, people go, that makes sense. And that comes down to representation. Who steers the power once we implement it, particularly in organizations that, by their very nature, operate in secret? Let me, let me ask you about that. With little accountability, we don't know. Let me ask you, you both about that. I think that when, uh, when a lot of the, the, the Snowden revelations first came out, people, a lot of people said, well, but our government is, is responsible. We're not going to go back to a period where Martin Luther King is, a, is a, considered a national security threat. We're not going to re revisit the days of COINTELPRO. There's safeguards in the system. You know, you have to trust the system and all that stuff. So first of all, I don't know that, that that's, you know, that I, not everybody believes that, obviously, but the, 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 the sort of the worst case scenario, people say, well, what happens if there's an authoritarian presidency? What if there's, you know, another Dick Cheney or, or worse? Well, as luck would have it, <laughs> we're now entertaining the notion of a Donald Trump presidency. So what happens in a more authoritarian regime when these tools are available, when there, is, uh, there are clearer threats to the regime, to the authoritarian regime, and the safeguards are still 
hopefully there, but they're invisible. What happens then? I mean, I think that, um, that the issue here is what's baked into the system. Um, because safeguards notwithstanding, however the system is architected from its inception, is how it will play out in the end. So, you know, we don't have to wait for the future. I mean, history is long and it goes backwards and forwards. The future is here and now, you know. Um, we just had a, a nationwide survey where 95% of police departments said they plan to move forward with body-worn cameras. And, you know, all the details be damned, right? They don't care, they, the details about uh, civil rights and human rights protections are, are not being considered in that process. Um, and yet the technology is being adopted. And that's all being built off this rhetoric, right, of safety and, you know, seeing police cameras as a false solution at the same time that the right to record is being eroded everywhere in this country. And, you know, and so, um, you know, bystander video is being considered something that's criminal, whereas police body-worn cameras are being considered something that will keep us safer. That, that does, we don't have to wait till for the future. The future is right now. Think about the other t police technologies already in play. We already have license plate readers and Stingray cell phone interceptors. We have facial recognition software and other biometric tools. And, you know, these tools are increasingly being used to spy on civilians that are participating in civil disobedience and other types of protests. So, you know, this question of what happens in a more authoritarian regime, I think we have to think to ourselves, what's happening right now? I mean, the question is, in a more authoritarian regime, uh, it will be more explicit. <laughs> but I don't think that that means that there will be more of it. It's already happening, you know? And the last thing I'll say is, you know, in addition to the kind of both warrantless and wanton use of police technologies, we have predictive policing as a practice that is gaining traction, uh, again, with few rules, with few limits. Um, you know, we're dealing with technologists who don't know anything about me, don't know anything about people like me, don't know anything about black communities, poor communities, gender non and non conforming communities, they don't live anywhere near where we live, don't live in our realities, and yet they're, they're architecting, you know, technologies that are meant to police us and, and, and that have devastating impact on our lives. So, in, in, you know, whether or not there's greater authoritarianism, or lesser authoritarianism, the system is created to, um, ex first of all, to expand. The carceral state is created to expand itself. And so these tools will continuously be used to that end. Ed? Yeah, I mean, this is a tremendously complex space. I think the easiest way to, uh, to address this is let's talk about what the NSA can actually do. Uh, and remember that this is not unique to the NSA. Uh, this is a capability that's accessible even to sophisticated criminal groups. Uh, a couple of bright grad students could replicate this technology uh, in the span of a couple of months. The question is just where do they place it? How do they use it? Now, the nexus of the NSA's capabilities, why they're so dangerous, uh, and this is the same for every state, is because they have power over the telecommunications providers, right? When you think about the nature of modern communications, how do things get from your phone to somebody else's phone, right? How does the phone actually ring in their pocket? There's all these telephones in the world, right? All these cell phones. How does it know which phone to ring? Well, the way this works is that your cell phone is constantly sort of squawking out a beacon as you go about your daily activities, you know, unbeknownst to you, to the nearest cell phone tower saying, I'm here, register me at this cell phone tower. So that the global network of telecommunications service providers together can at any point in time say, hey, I've got this phone number. Immediately, you know, in the span of, of less than a second, uh, find out where that phone is and make that phone ring. Locate it, tell me everything about it, tell me whether it's been paid or not, uh, and then make it ring, set up a connection, so on and so forth. You're always connected to this instrument of power as long as you were connected to the network. Now, when I was sitting at the NSA in Hawaii, 
And I was working with the tools of mass surveillance directly, right? You know, people are focused on uh, the PowerPoint slides that are in the newspapers and whatnot. The PowerPoint slides are public or, or published. Uh, you know, journalists tend to prefer those to like drive policy documents because they're visual, they tell a story very briefly. Uh, but the actual facts of how this works are it's Google for the world's telecommunications traffic. That's both internet and phones and anything else that they can find a new vector into, which means I can find out everywhere you've been on the basis of your devices. Mm -hmm. What other devices do you such as, you know, what other phones stay at the same places you stay at when I can tell them you're sleeping with? I can derive a portrait pattern of life when you wake up, when you go to bed, when you go to work, how you get there, your routines and methods of travel, whether or not you speed uh, based on how fast your phone travels. Uh, you know, the amount of power is extraordinary. And this is just talking about metadata, right? I can tell what books. Because Amazon, when you're browsing around and selecting books uh, and so on and so forth, that's unencrypted, right? I don't even need to compel Amazon to assist me in doing that because it's traveling electronically naked. Whoever has their hands on these levers of power is presiding over a kind of turnkey tyranny. Uh, and we have to remember that policy is the weakest restraint on power that we have. We've got the Constitution, we've got statutes, uh, and even those get violated. Policy is constantly in flux, and it's often changed secretly without our knowledge. If the only thing that's protecting us from somebody turning this key is our faith that the policies are in place and have not changed, we're in a position of vulnerability. Yeah, and uh, I think that the only answer that we have really is uh, transparency, which we don't have. Uh, and the only way we can get it right now is whistleblowers. Uh, so thank you. <laughs> um, I, I wanted to uh, ask you guys to talk to this audience here for a moment. Uh, people who are involved in representing uh, communities and issues that are not always uh, popular to the establishment, as it were, um, who could be, or as Malky would put it, already are targets of surveillance. Um, what, what do they need to do on a practical level to protect themselves? And let me first do a little show of hands here. How many of you use encryption in your email? Uh, I got more chuckles than I got hands, I should point out. <laughs> I got about five or six hands and about a dozen, about a dozen, uh, a dozen of chuckles. Um, so, so Malkia, tell us a little bit about sort of what, what advice you'd give this group here first. Well, I think uh, Ed probably knows a ton more about what individuals can do to protect themselves than I do. So I like to, I, I can share what we, I think, as a society can do. Um, I think that we need to update computer policy for um, that, so that it actually protects the First and Fourth Amendment in the digital age. Um, I think that that's the primary, first and foremost thing that we need to do. I think the second big thing that we need is we need journalists like you, Dan, to tell the story um, from the perspective of those whose voices are generally left out. We need to not start the clock on surveillance with 2013. We need to start that clock much, much old, much longer ago than that. Um, I think that we need to uh, affirmatively protect the right to record of civilians and not only affirm the right to record of the police. Um, I think that, you know, I think the, the last thing I'll say is this, um, and the biggest thing that I think we need to do is I think we need to grow racial justice movements that, um, that actually fight for these First and Fourth Amendment rights as part of the movement itself, right? So that we don't just fight for our for fundamental rights like food and, and shelter and, and the, what's basic to humanity, but recognizing that this fight around First and Fourth Amendment rights is central to the fight for racial justice. And that that fight actually requires 
um, new revenues, new leaders, and new resources. Yeah, amen. And I think basically any, whether it's racial justice or social justice, criminal justice, any other justice issues, economic justice that, that you guys are involved in, if we don't have the First and Fourth Amendments protecting us, protecting your communications, uh, the battle is, uh, is much harder to win, That's if, if, if at all. Um, Ed, uh, you know, one of the huge people say, well, what has Ed Snowden accomplished? And one thing for sure that you've accomplished is raise the popularity of encryption and the notion that we need to take steps individually to protect ourselves and that you've, I mean, the, the extraordinary uh, activism uh, on, part, on, on the part of uh, technology companies not known for their activism uh, by building these new things. Uh, obviously, uh, I'll just give you a chance to put a pitch in for get, making sure every one of these people get the crypts their emails going forward. <laughs> you know, this is, this is a complex space. Uh, and if we had the rest of the week, you know, we can talk about this a little bit. But when we try to compress it, the intelligence community has a $75 billion a year budget when you count military intelligence programs. That's more than we spend on things like the National Science Foundation. So on and so forth. Uh, despite the fact that terrorists claim fewer lives than the bathtub calls for police officers in our country. Uh, and when we think about you know, these, these accesses and these, these pushes uh, that are occurring for more and more powers, this is actually not just a policy question, this is a political question. Um, the question is what kind of world we want to live in. Do we want to live in a society where no American can pick the phone without worrying about who's listening? Do they have to worry about what their Google searches are going to look like to some government official, you know, 15 years down the road, 25 years down the road? When you can't even remember what you searched in that box last week. Uh, when people say, you know, I, I don't have anything to find, yes, there are political answers to this, like saying, you know, um, arguing that you don't care about the privacy because you have nothing to hide, it's no different than saying you don't care about freedom of speech because you have nothing to say. But that, that was another point of the fact that there's actually vulnerability in there. Surveillance is about safety. Surveillance is about power. That's right. right? When we look at Section 215, that Patriot Act program, uh, the first one that was revealed by the courts on the basis of the archive, uh, that the courts found unconstitutional, Congress eventually uh, changed with the legislation. It was operating for decades in the most extreme way. They collected everyone's records. And yet they said it never stopped a single eminent terrorist attack in the United States. It never even made a concrete difference in a single terrorist investigation. These are their words, not mine, right? And this is a board that included like the deputy director of the CIA. Not exactly flaming liberals here. Um, so we've got this balance where you're at, or the government's asking you to create a society in which there can never occur a conversation to which the government is not party, which is a radical change uh, in the nature of human society that's never existed before. We always had privacy within the walls of our homes. Uh, communications were ephemeral. We go to confession in the church, nobody hears it, there's no record. Uh, you know, even when you wrote a letter, there was no long term uh, record of that unless you were already under investigation. Someone was uh, basically doing some kind of pen register to, to do that. Now, all mail being sent to the U.S. Postal Service is scanned uh, to detect fraud and things like that. I'm oh, sorry. Um, and when we, when we think about this, if I had all of your records for just the last 30 days, and at the end of those, I accused you of a crime that you did not commit. Do you think you could defend yourself? I know everything you did and you don't. Right. Now, how do we defend that? How do we stop that? How do we prevent that? Trying to fight on one of these two bases where I argue here in the audience, you know, use GPG, uh, encrypt your calls, encrypt your texts, which by the way, if you want to do this the easy way for your smartphone, just use Signal. Uh, it's an app in <laughs> any of those stores you get it. Uh, I use it, uh, it's pretty solid, it's not unbeatable, uh, but it's very strong. Uh, and of course it's warm. Uh, this is like saying, you know, constitutional rights should be transmitted via word of mouth. That's not how it should 
work in a free society. Uh, we have to change things on policy level. We have to change things on political level. We have to use the technical community to enforce our rights through new technical means in ways that are reliable, that are robust, that actually work at scale. So rather than you having to take some action, it happens without your knowledge. Now, we do have some evidence today of methods that do work. The Apple versus the FBI case is a good example of this. The FBI would not be as pissed off as they are <laughs> if it was not effective. Now, there is a uh, The FBI is working in court that Apple has the exclusive technical means. These are the words in their own court documents. Exclusive technical means of getting in this phone. Uh, respectfully, that's horseshit. <laughs> right, I think we need to wrap things up. Um, let me. Let me. There, there are hardware attacks that have existed since the nineties that the FBI came out unilaterally, but I'll do it. I, I like respectfully. That's bullshit. I think that's very appropriate. Um, I, we need to wrap things up. I want to ask you one last question. At thirty seconds, um, the Intercept is about to run a big story about the fact that this year's topic for the national high school debate topic, uh, the, the policy debate, is resolved. The United States federal government should substantially curtail its domestic surveillance. Tens of thousands of students, honest to God, kids at high schools all over the country are debating this issue this year, this spring. Um, Ed, 30 seconds. What's your message to them? I'm encouraged and uh, amazed that we have this happening on, on this kind of broad it's important because people have to have a chance early on to think about what they care about, what the domain of their rights should really be, where the boundaries should be drawn, and to draw them themselves. Right? Our rights are inherent to us uh, as individuals, as a society. They're inherent to our nature, They're not granted by governments, merely guaranteed by governments. And when we talk about encryption, right, and they say, oh, this, that, or the other, they're missing the point. It's not really about encryption. Encryption is a means to an end. Encryption is a method of enforcing rights to which you're already entitled. The real question here is, do you have a right to have a conversation only with yourself? Do you have a space to develop your own ideas before you're comfortable sharing them with the world? Do you have a right to enjoy the fruits of your own intellect in the privacy of your home, your community, and your associates without it having been intercepted, uh, analyzed, and fundamentally in basic sense, prejudged by others who are not All right, thank you both so much. It's been a real honor for me to talk to you. Thank you. Hang up on you guys now. <laughs> Didn't think I'd ever hang up on that stuff. Hey, what do you <laughs> All right, thank you. So you're taking over. Thank you, Dan. Thank you, everybody. Um, I'll do it. Jenny's next. All right. I will remind you what is next. Thank you so much, Dan, and for that very oh, thank interesting you. Um, wow, really, really interesting and important conversation.